I live in a prefecture where there's a house with blue roof tiles and decrepit windows. It once belonged to a family of Bunraku artisans who were known puppeteers and famous for their lifelike dolls. But as the advent of film came along, their popularity diminished, and their children, in order to make ends meet, slowly began leaving the family business in search of other ventures. Eventually, the home was abandoned. Over the years, the local officials have made promises to tear the place down, but each time, the cranes and workers would quietly disperse before anything was ever accomplished. As the residents of the area, most of us knew better than to ask what became of the demolitions. We hoped that one day, someone would make good on their word. And although many have tried, I never expected to be involved. But there I was, a member of the zoning committee for the Chambers of Commerce, working alongside my co-worker to determine how to expand the nearby shopping district. My co-worker, Yamamoto Date, was a man with two last names, which was problematic as custom dictates that a man with two last names was difficult to address properly, as we often refer to acquaintances by their surnames, and close family and friends by their given name. So, it became rather confusing addressing my colleague and friend as either Yamamoto or Date, due to the impressions that our department wasn't close-knit which is important in our prefecture, as we believed that well-accustomed workers signified an efficient system, which was likely why we drew the ire of the local seniors who were gathered around the zoning tape we had masked around the property. That day, I discovered damage around the perimeter. It looks like char, he rubbed the wood post. Smells like it too. Ugh, the old man complained. They don't even know about the fire in 83. Did the officials send us newcomers? A woman from the gatherers asked. No, it seems that man's name is Date, another voice answered. Hmm, came the consensus. I whispered to my friend. And that's why you'll never attain great office here. He chuckled. My mother thought it was clever giving me two last names so that I would always be addressed formally. I bet she never expected that to become a problem, as we didn't live around here. He stood up and approached the older man. Sir, it seems as if you are well informed of the events which happened on this property. Could you please explain to us what happened in 83? The old man cracked his dry lips. There was a boy who wandered inside the house. He was missing for three days before the other students would admit that they had dared the boy to go inside and sleep with the dolls for the night. Dolls? Yes, the dolls. Have you been told nothing? I've been briefly instructed by my seniors, that I admitted. However, I wasn't aware that there were still belongings inside. He turned to me. Perhaps we would have to document and store all the items in case the family comes looking in the future. Bah, the old man grunted. They're never coming back here. And why not? Not after what happened to the mother. The old man spat. Genji, a woman clicked. Do not spread false rumors. His eyes widened. Rumors? How is it a rumor when we have all heard it? Still scrawling about at night, waking me up, disturbing my sleep, giving no decency or regards to the tired. The woman clicked her tongue again. Just let them do their jobs. Do not put ideas in their heads. Ma'am, if you don't mind, I would quite like to hear about what happened. It could prove invaluable. Genji scoffed. See, Chi, I'm doing the community a service. Then it is well gossiped that the daughter of the household gave birth to a doll. At this, the others gasped. Hush, he can hear you. That was my line, Genji grumbled. Bah, he said while wobbling angrily away. I hope the house takes you, you old hag. Come on, Date told me as the crowd began to thin. You have to get the proper documents for this. 
Several days later, we would learn of Chi's passing. Many suspected that an ongoing feud between her and Genji was the cause of her demise. However, when the newspapers reported her death, they included a photo of the alleged crime scene. And it was the way she was positioned that made me believe otherwise. It looked as if someone had propped her up against the wall and held her hands at a certain angle until rigor mortis set in. When Date and I finally returned to the dollhouse, the place was deserted as the scandal nearly took all of the attention, which left us alone with the house for the first time. It was eerie to stand in the lawn where the overgrown weeds had pushed aside the pebbled walkways. The rancid wood porch looked as if we would snap in half at our weight, and the rice paper screens were pocked full of holes from lack of attention over the decades where it had stood undisturbed. A feeling in my gut knotted as Date slid open a door he had discovered to be unlocked. And I was glad that we were at least met with much of the same dust that had settled on the exterior. For me, it meant that no one had been occupying this space. I thought they were supposed to turn on the power, Date exclaimed. Not that there's much electricals in here, he mused. It was already old before it was abandoned, I agreed. The deed pins the original foundations to around the Edo period. Perhaps the rats have chewed through the wiring. Perhaps. I snapped a few photos. It looks like we're going to need a moving crew after all. I wonder why this wasn't noted by the local clerks. Perhaps they were, I commented. But the records could have been lost after the department digitized everything. He nodded. Shame that we have to cart this stuff off to a storage somewhere. Antiques are profitable today, you know. Don't even think about it. I snapped a photo of him holding an old paperweight from the writing desk. Come on, he smiled. Let's go deeper inside the house. We had explored several rooms that were filled with a musky odor, and I had adapted quite well to the smell by now when a sudden wafer-thin stench came from behind a door we had yet to enter. While every single panel we had come across showed signs of age, this one looked untouched. Date reached for it, and I almost stopped him. But, as this was our duty, I watched, transfixed, as it opened. Inside were hundreds of dolls, lined up against the walls. Some sat on the floor, others on shelves. No matter their positioning, they were stacked shoulder to shoulder, front to back in neat sequences, facing outward, each of them unique and ranging in size. I let out a gasp as my flashlight beamed into a corner where a stark figure stood against the second doorway at the end. That I laughed when it turned out to be nothing more than a doll about his height. Almost looks real, doesn't it? He motioned for me. Well, come on then. As he walked over and stood next to the doll. Take a picture. I shook my head. What? Come on now, for a report. I sighed and reluctantly snapped a photo. The bright light consuming the darkness. And when I looked up. That day was missing. Date? I called out. He didn't answer. I shot my flashlight across the seemingly endless rows of dolls that this room was built for. Yamamoto! I shouted angrily. Stop messing around! Still, he did not answer. I could see the doorway at the end, now slightly ajar, when it had been closed earlier. I took a single step forward in order to give him an earful about his manners, when I heard my feet crisp the board beneath me, and jumped as the door behind me slammed shut. I nearly wet myself as I scrambled to the other side, my flashlight bouncing across the top of the doll's heads. This isn't funny, I shouted. I had a scratching nearby, and so I aimed my flashlight in that direction, skipping over the rows of sculpted faces until one of them blinked. It was all I needed to see 
before running through the doorway on the other side where I came crashing headfirst into Date as he tried to hold me upright. What's wrong? He asked me. Date, I almost screamed. Where did you go? After you took the photo, I saw this behind me. Look. The room was unlike any of the others we had seen. It was taller than any cathedral I had ever been inside. So dark, our flashlight shied away from the top as they illuminated the entrenched floor. There, on the ground, was a miniature city. It's a scaled version of the area, Yamamoto exclaimed. Look, I can see my house. He pointed to a nearby corner. You don't understand. I saw that dull blink. He waved me off. That's common with dolls. I believe my sister had one grown up that could pretend to sleep if you laid it down. Th the door, I stuttered. It slammed shut behind me. Spring loaded, he answered. Most of the ones I opened were. Really expensive back in the day. Difficult to build properly too. But an easy task for doll makers. He pointed. Would you take a look at this? It's inside the dollhouse. He reached forward to touch it. And that was when something came out of the corner and grabbed him. I screamed as they struggled, the light splitting the darkness as their labored breathing filled the room. Several times I tried to help, until finally a blow struck me and I fell backwards hard on the floor, enough for my head to bounce, causing my camera to crack. I could hardly discern the blotted figures in front of me as my vision blurred, but by the flashlight on the floor, I could make out a hunched figure, white as porcelain, with long, gnarled arms and squanched legs. It lifted Yamamoto's body and slammed him down several times on the floor before dragging him away into the back of the room, back into the darkness. I screamed and tried to run but the door was sealed shut. No matter how much I struggled, I couldn't get it to open. I banged on the frame to no avail, crying as I heard the snarling and crunching of bones behind me. But then it stopped, and the room fell silent. That eh? I cried out, afraid to look, but eventually forcing myself to face the seemingly empty room. He took this chance to find my glasses on the floor and backed into a dark corner, half afraid that something would reach out from behind me and half afraid that the creature would appear again in front. I pressed my shoulders against the wall and slowly crept over to the door. I tried it again, but it would not budge. Helpless, I did the only thing I could think of, and that was to crawl forward and grab the flashlight slowly panning the light across the room when I heard a noise. It was then that I realized that something was moving inside the miniature city. I shined my light down and saw tiny figures moving through the streets. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, causing me to lean forward on my hands and knees until I could get a better look. Dolls tiny animatronic dolls that were moving throughout the city. Cars even, the tiny plastic wheels skimming the road as they made stops and turns, it almost looked as if the city were alive. They were moving so perfectly that it almost looked magical. And as I drew closer, I noticed something else unusual. It was difficult to see so I got even closer until I was nearly standing inside the city. I saw the doll of a woman walking along the side of the road. She looked so lifelike that her hair even moved as if it were windy, but it moved oddly as pieces of it were stuck to a nearly translucent string attached to the top of her head. I got even closer and touched it. The doll nearly tripped, but I didn't care as I followed the string upwards with my finger and shining the light into the ceiling. There were masked figures clad by the shadows looking down at me. 
they dotted the upper banisters like owls in a barn. My knees buckled as I backed roughly into a corner, pulling out my phone and dialing the police. I was so relieved that an operator picked up that I immediately began screaming for help. I told them that I was in the dollhouse and that there were people inside and that they killed my friend. The officer in the line kept reassuring me that they were sending help right away. Yeah, that's right, I shouted to the mass people above me. They're coming to get you, so stay away from me. But they still watched me, silently as I talked, never stopping me. And it was from the corner that I saw it. From a pile of buses and cars on the floor, a police vehicle righted itself and rolled onto the board. It ran all of the red lights, and the dolls in the miniature city turned their heads as it passed. Then, as if a curtain was slightly drawn, a window appeared to the left of the room, and I realized that we were now looking at the same street that was being shown on the board. There was even a real live police vehicle zooming towards us. I saw the red and blue lights punching the sky as the siren wailed in the distance. I was still smiling as I turned around at the sight of my rescue. But I stopped smiling when I saw that the creature had reappeared and was standing on the other side of the room. It reached a long skinny arm around the city and with its finger it pushed the police toy on the board away as it neared the dollhouse using its withered nail to guide the car down the street until it rolled off the board and onto the floor. Behind me, I could hear the police sirens disappearing, the sound growing further and further away. The creature slowly backed into the darkness, and the door opened. I stumbled out of the room and back into the hall with the dolls. I fell several times as I ran away, the door shutting behind me after every threshold until I found myself back on the lawn, outside, panting. They tried to burn it too, after the boy disappeared. I jumped at the voice behind me. It was the old man. He was leaning against the wood fence. But all that did was cause the lights to go on for a few years. After the house swallowed the fire, it made it worse if you ask me. Then he scratched the top of his head as if pulling on something. It's best if you leave it alone now. What? I managed. I can't do that. What about Date? The old man cracked a smile. He'll be back. You'll see. And he was right. After I'd made numerous reports to the police and my superiors, they were squashed and I was deemed overworked the moment Date came through the doors on Monday. Completely unharmed and unblemished. Except now, he only answered, Tiamamoto.